Well, good morning. It is true we have come to magnify the Lord. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us today. And if you are a guest here, we want to extend a special welcome to you. Uh, we would like to get to know you more, to pray for you, and see how we can serve you in any way. And there's a card right in the back of the pew, of the pew in front of you. You grab that card. It's a next step card. And then you can pass it uh, to the ushers at the end on your way out. And that's how we can know how we can serve you and pray for you. And we'd love to get to know you. We're going to now turn our attention to God's Word from the book of Psalms, Psalm 67, and listen to what God's Word says to us as we are called to continue in worship this morning. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make His face to shine upon us, that Your way might be known on earth, Your saving power among all the peoples. Let the peoples praise You, O God. Let all the peoples praise You. Then let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations on earth. Let's go to the Lord in worship and prayer. Father, we are here to celebrate, to magnify your name, whether we are young or old or everywhere in between, I ask that you would lift our hearts up filled with joy to praise you and I pray. I ask that our praise would be a testimony in our city so that all of Jacksonville might come to know all of your son Jesus for all of life. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen, church. Let's do exactly what the psalmist has said. Let's stand, sing with joy, and let the peoples praise him.
Hey, Ben. What a gift it is to worship with you this morning, to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what we do every Sunday. We want to focus our minds' attention, our hearts' affection on Jesus. And this next song does it so very, very well as we're reminded that I can do nothing of my own strength. Yet not I, but through Christ, I can do all things. And so we turn our attention, we devote our hearts and our lives to him, this gift of grace that is Jesus. What gift of grace is Jesus my
If you remember nothing else from our singing this morning, remember that phrase, yet not I, but through Christ in me, and you'll have all you need for this next week. We continue in our worship with the reading of Scripture as Stuart Rigdon comes to lead us. If you'll join me in reading 2 Timothy 1, 5. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Good morning. Good morning. You can be seated. You've earned it. You've been working so hard. These precious... Uh, Students up here don't get such a break, so uh, we'll, uh, we'll repay you later for that. We uh, were just reminded in that passage of Scripture of a couple of things, actually, that we talk about all the time. One thing is I always tell you that we want our members, every member, to do what Jesus commands every follower of His in the New Testament, and that is to grow in your relationship with Jesus. Another thing you hear us talk about a lot is how at our church we have a multi-generational commitment to pursuing godliness. We love that we have a multi-generational congregation with everybody from great-great-grandparents to great-great-grandchildren. And I always tell you and you always appreciate how good and how beautiful and wonderful our choir and orchestra always are, but I think we have to admit that they're just a little bit better today, don't you think? We're so grateful for all of you and the job that you're all doing. I, I don't know if you, can you hear, I can hear really well from where I'm sitting, the additional young voices singing in Jesus. And it is so encouraging. I just want to say to all of you who are leading us, we're very, very grateful for you and your pointing us to Jesus. Thank you for doing that. It's a remarkable thing that one of the most glorious mechanisms for growth in Jesus in the New Testament is singing. And to be able to sing together, young and old, middle-aged and everybody else, uh, we are so privileged to have the opportunity to do that. I should also let you know that it's not just different ages. We're also grateful that our Sean ministry is up here leading us as well, and we're thankful for them. It is... It's a remarkable joy to grow in Jesus, to grow in Jesus with all ages, and to do it with the remarkable gift of singing. Let's pray and thank Him for that. Father, we are grateful to grow in Jesus. We are grateful to grow in Jesus as we remind each other of truth. We're, great, we're grateful for the opportunity to remind each other of truth as we sing. And Father, we are grateful for these students from across our next generation and our Sean ministries. We're grateful for their service to you and their service to us. Father, we pray for each precious boy and girl, man and woman, that you would hold them close to you, that you would help them to believe for the rest of their life every precious word that they are singing with us. And Father, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to introduce a new song to you this morning, and this is a song that comes to us from our student ministry. A group of our student ministry worship leaders went to Nashville last fall for a conference on congregational singing. They heard this song. It was brand new at the time, and they said, our church needs to sing this song. And so here we are in this multi-gen Sunday, and we're going to introduce it to you. So I'm going to let you remain seated initially as we teach you the verse and the chorus. And then we'll pick it up again. I'll have you stand and we'll repeat that verse and chorus and sing the whole song. So choir, would you join me? Would you stand? Because you know it. And uh, let's teach our congregation this beautiful new song. You made the starry host. You trace the mountain peaks. You paint the evening sky with wonders. The earth that is your throne.
that's it. It's based on Psalm 150, and it's just called Praise the Lord. Let's stand and join them now as we sing this song. Thank you for learning that new song. We'll be singing that again soon. You may be seated. in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2, verses 23 to 33. Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 to 33. 
You look at the ministry of Jesus and you learn a remarkable lesson. The remarkable lesson actually never ceases to shock me every time I think about it. And it is this, Jesus had enemies. Jesus, the incarnation of love and glory, God incarnate, the perfect representation of the glory and presence of God himself, came to earth and was perfectly faithful, did everything right, said everything he was supposed to say, and in return, a lot of people hated him. The last phase of Jesus' life is actually a case study in Jesus' response to people who absolutely couldn't stand him. Here, in this passage today, we encounter Jesus' engagement with a group of people called the Sadducees. They've come up before, but Matthew mostly focuses on the Pharisees. Well, the deal is, is that the Pharisees hated Jesus, and the Sadducees hated Jesus, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees hated one another. But the way this works, you know this, is that the uh, enemy of your enemy is your friend. And so the Sadducees and the Pharisees, if they don't at least conspire together, at least they've got the same target and they want to come after Jesus. Uh, the Sadducees have learned with the Pharisees that an open confrontation and rebuke of Jesus isn't going to work. And so now both the Pharisees and the Sadducees are trying to undermine Jesus in more subtle ways with questions. In this passage, the Sadducees try to undermine the work of Jesus Christ by coming at him with a question that they perceive to be a doozy. And we read about it in Matthew chapter 22, verses 23 to 33. This is what God says. On that day, some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus and questioned him, asking, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother as next of kin shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers with us, and the first married and died, and having no children, left his wife to his brother. So also the second and the third, down to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had married her. But Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not understanding the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. Let's pray. Father, here with my family, I want to lead us in a prayer with just one request that I want to ask of you on behalf of each one of us. And that is that today we would hear Jesus. We would see Jesus. And all of our fascination with TikTok feeds and Instagram videos and online checking and cable news would be driven out. And what would be left is a great and glorious vision of Jesus that would astonish us, that would drive us to marvel at who he is and what he says. Father, I'm asking you this in Jesus' name. 
Amen. I was a little boy, and I was at a store, I think Kmart, but I don't remember. Anybody remember Kmart? I think, I, was, I think it was Kmart, but I'm not sure. And I think I was at Kmart with my granny, but I'm not sure. I don't remember because none of that mattered. What mattered was what I was looking at on the shelf. <laughs> Boy. And on the shelf in front of my little eyes was a pair of pajamas wrapped up in plastic. And on the cover of the plastic packaging was a little boy with a Superman pajama outfit on. It had the blue and the seal and the cape, and he looked so happy. And I wanted them. I wanted them because I had seen Superman in action. I'm not talking about new Superman. I'm talking about 1970s Christopher Reeves Superman. I'm talking about the helicopter falls off the building. You remember? And John Williams starts to play. Na, da, 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 na, 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 na. You know it? And Superman appears and lifts up the helicopter and puts it on the building. And I wanted to do that. <laughs> and I knew if someone would get me these pajamas, I could do it. Somehow I begged and pleaded and cajoled and I got them. And I went home and in the middle of the day, I put on the Superman pajamas. And it was immediate disappointment, I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> they, were, they were too short. Um, the cape attached with these little Velcro tabs, which looked cheap, didn't look at all like the picture. And the cape hung down up to above the small of my back. That's not how Superman's cape was. And I tried to fly, and you couldn't do that in the Superman pajamas. What I wound up doing was standing on the edge of the bed and leaning out over it like this, trying to, trying to one time I tried balancing my whole body on the arm of the chair, and that didn't work. No John Williams music played. After a couple of weeks of wear, there was all these knit, wadded up balls on the thing. It looked cheap and trashy. It was utter disappointment. It was an early lesson about the way life works. You get these extraordinary visions of how great it's going to be. And then an ordinary life just makes things regular and ordinary and disappointing. You come to expect it. You get married. And oh, she's so cute. And oh, he's so funny. And everything's going to be wonderful and perfect. And you're going to be the couple that never has conflict. And then you're married like two weeks and you're like laying there awake looking over there amazed at how angry one human being can make you. <laughs> Because an ordinary world just shoves down your extraordinary expectations. You buy your dream house. You save up and you tour it and you look at the pictures and it's going to be wonderful. And it's going to be happy and you're going to skip through the living room and the flowers out front are going to be beautiful. And then you buy that house and you find out that that house needs just as much maintenance as the house you moved out of. And you find the walls of that house wrap around a family that has just as many problems in that house as they did in the other one. And an ordinary life presses down all of your extraordinary expectations and you meet disappointment. You go to the doctor and they say, we're going to fix your hip. And they fix it. And then you feel the other one. <laughs> you go to the doctor. And for two years they tell you, we're going to fix your brain. We're going to fix your brain. And two years later, your brain isn't fixed. 
You have all these extraordinary expectations. Everything's going to be wonderful. Everything's going to be better than wonderful. Everything's going to be great. And then it's not. Ordinary life just comes in and makes life hard and disappointment. And that ordinary, not glorious world trains us to expect the ordinary. It trains us to expect disappointment. The journey to adulthood, many people would describe as just a journey of realizing that things aren't going to be as good as you thought they were going to be when you had all your bright, shiny expectations of the extraordinary. An ordinary world makes us disappointed, and I want you to see that that's what's happening with the Sadducees. This ruling class of Jewish leaders, a little higher on the pecking order in the ancient world than the Pharisees were. And the first thing we learn about the Sadducees in verse 23 is that they say there is no resurrection. These are a group of people who are religious, they know the Bible, they take God seriously, but an ordinary world has trained them to expect disappointment and to have ordinary expectations, and it led them to say, this life is all there is, and when you die, your soul does the same thing your body does, and it just gives up its vitality, and it stops existing. An ordinary world had trained them to just expect more ordinary things and to expect disappointment. And they make a ridiculous argument. In their effort to trip Jesus up, in their conviction that there's nothing past this life, they think they've got a way to trip up Jesus. Everybody thinks that. Everybody's wrong. But that's what they think. And they come to Jesus and they remind him of what the Bible says. They remind him in verse 24 that Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother, as next of kin, shall marry his wife and raise up children for his brother. That's what the Bible says. It's what Moses says. This is their path in to demonstrating the ridiculousness of the idea of a resurrection. It's their path in to persuade Jesus and all of his followers that life is just really, really ordinary and there's nothing extraordinary beyond it. And they remind him in this passage of what is called leveret marriage. Leveret marriage is an idea, it's a principle taught in the Old Testament from Moses, and here's how it works. If you marry a man... And he dies before you have kids, his brother has the opportunity to marry you to perpetuate his family beyond the grave. So the brother of your dead husband has dibs on you, which will, at this point in the sermon, make many of you incredibly grateful for progress. So they say, okay, there's leveret marriage. What about this, Mr. Jesus, Mr. Believer in a Resurrection? So woman marries man and he dies. She marries his brother. He dies. Then she marries the third brother and he dies and the fourth brother and he dies and the fifth brother and he dies and the sixth brother and he dies and the seventh brother and he dies and and then she dies because she had to after that. There's nothing left for her to do after that. All right, Jesus, now they're all dead. Whose wife is she? This is the big thing that's going to stump Jesus. This is the big argument they've got that proves there's nothing wonderful after death. Is a trick, ridiculous question. And Jesus responds, and I'll just tell you, essentially what Jesus says is, boys, that is a stupid question. And he responds 
to some of the details of their question. He says in verse 30, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven, Jesus says. Jesus says, your thought about a resurrection, you're thinking about the, the resurrection the way you're thinking about this life. And he's teaching you, there's, it's a different order over there. There's a different way of living. There's a different way of existing over there. It's, it's not the way you think it is here. It's not like this ordinary life. It's something extraordinary. And he says, over there, in that resurrection, there is no marriage or giving in marriage. He says, your relationships in heaven are different. And in fact, in heaven, in the resurrection, you're not going to get married to anybody, and you won't be married to anybody. And there are a couple of responses to that. Some of you here in heaven, you're not going to get married to anybody, and you're not going to be married to anybody, and some of you go, thank God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because <laughs> I'm going to get some relief. Some of you say, oh no. Some of you say, I love my wife. And I love my husband, and I can't imagine heaven without them as my spouse. Well, Jesus' teaching is not meant to inspire either relief or sorrow. It's meant to teach you that things are going to be different there. It's meant to reframe your expectations. And if you are nervous about this, let me just promise you that ever how good you think heaven is going to be and ever what you think heaven needs to be, Jesus will make it better than that. He says there's not going to be marriage or giving in marriage. He doesn't say there won't be relationship. He doesn't say there won't be knowledge of one another. He does not say there won't be love. In fact, all of those things will just exist in more abundant, more full measure than they do right now. There won't be any interruption in your relationship. There won't be any disruption in your love for one another. Lauren and I have a deal that when our lives end and our marriage ends and we get to heaven and we are not married, we're still going to love each other and we have an ongoing commitment for walks together in heaven. I can't wait to do that. If the Lord will let me, I'm going to try to hold her hand too. <laughs> Whatever you're thinking though, it'll be better than that. And he says, in that place called the resurrection, you'll be like the angels in heaven. Jesus does not say you will become an angel. Listen, you are a human being. You have a status that is exalted far above the angels and in the created order is only succeeded by God himself. You bear the image of God. You have a soul that will never die. Jesus Christ came to redeem you with his precious blood. You don't want to be an angel. Jesus says you'd be like an angel. You'd be like an angel in that you are with God all the time and you are blissfully happy. You'd be like an angel in that you aren't married. Angels aren't married and you won't be either. And they manage to be gloriously happy and you will be too. Jesus pushes back on the details of their question, but that's not the main thing Jesus does. The main thing Jesus does is attack their assumption. What Jesus does is he looks at these religious leaders, these fancy pants, Jewish ruling aristocracy. And he looks at people who have been trained 
by an ordinary world to expect nothing that is extraordinary. And he says, shockingly, in verse 29, you are mistaken. Not understanding the scriptures, nor the power of God. You religious experts, you people with all of your religious and holy badges, you don't understand the scriptures. And you don't understand the power of God. You have forgotten in your focus on the ordinary, being caught up in the midst of the disappointments of a sinful and a broken world. You have forgotten the truth of God. And you have forgotten the power of God that is able to turn every bad thing into something more glorious than you can ever fit into your brain. You've forgotten it. And what he does is he talks about the resurrection. He talks about a world of wonder and glory. He introduces them to an extraordinary existence that they forgot or never knew. And the thing you just have to understand today is he's doing that for you. You might not have the same doubts and the same temptations that the Sadducees have. I bet you don't. But you live in an ordinary world just like they did. You live in an ordinary world that just trains you repeatedly that nothing is going to be as good as you think it might be. And in this passage, Jesus Christ is opening up to you a vision of this glorious and extraordinary world of wonder that is better than anything you could imagine. He reminds you that the truth of God corrects your false assumptions about the way an ordinary world works. He reminds you that there is great holy power to overcome everything bad and broken and make it wonderful. There is, in the midst of this ordinary world, an extraordinary God who speaks, who acts, who sends His Son for you. And to remind you, and to help you see what the Sadducees don't see. And as I have thought about you this week, and as I have prayed for you, and as I've reflected on the conversations that I have with all of you every week, I've thought about where, where does this precious family of believers need to be reminded of the Word of God and the power of God the way the Sadducees did? And I came up with three things. This is just based on our conversations. This is based on what I know about you. And I want for the next few moments to point you to this world of glory that Jesus opens up for you in the midst of an ordinary world full of the disappointments that I know that you're all experiencing. Here's the first thing. Your prodigal children don't need to follow an ordinary path. Oh, I need you to hear me on this one. Your prodigal children do not need to follow an ordinary path. I think that in our church, I have had more conversations of heartbreak about this topic than any other one. We have a church full of people who the Lord blessed with children, and you did it right. You really did. You didn't do it perfect. Good night, because nobody does. There, there hasn't ever been a perfect parent. It didn't start with you, and it didn't end with you. You didn't do it perfectly, but you did it right. 
You brought those kids to church. You taught them the Bible. You told them Jesus was their Savior. You taught them the songs. You prayed with them. You bought them Bibles, and you bought them books, and you put your arm around them, and you told them that you loved them. And they grew up, and they bounced right out of here, and now they don't give a rip about the things of God. They don't care about Jesus. They don't care about the Bible. They don't care about church. And it breaks your heart. I'm so sorry for the sorrow that you're going through. You wake up thinking about those poor kids, and you go to bed thinking about those poor kids. And here's the thing. This ordinary world trains you to think that when your prodigal children that you love bounce out of church, they're never coming back. They're just going to keep on doing what they're doing. They're going to keep on living with who they're living with. They're going to keep on drinking what they're drinking. They're going to keep on doing what they're doing, and they're never going to come back. And I want to remind you of the truth of God and of the great power of God. God speaks a word into your heart today. I want you to listen to the words of Jesus Christ in John chapter 5, verse 25. This is what Jesus says, truly, truly, listen, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live That's Jesus Christ. When he talks about dead people and when he talks about life in that verse, he's not talking about the physical realities alone. When he says dead people hear the voice of God, he's talking about spiritually dead people. He's talking about your kids. He's talking about your kids that hate God, that love sin, that maybe don't like you very much. And he says they're dead. They're dead in trespasses and sins. But the day is here when spiritually dead ears hear the powerful voice of the Son of God and they spring into life. That's the world we're living in. It's no ordinary world. Jesus came to create a day, the day you're living in, where lost people where dead people turn from their path and believe. I am here this morning to remind you of the truth of God and the power of God that this is no ordinary world and your prodigal children don't have to follow an ordinary path. They can be saved. They can change. Your struggle with sin, your struggle with sin, does not need to follow an ordinary path. We can struggle with sin in a couple of different ways. You can struggle with sin. I can struggle with sin. We have our own individual struggles with sin, but then we live with people. We relate to people that struggle with sin too. And whether the sin is ours or somebody else's, it's destructive. It's painful. It's horrifying. And here's the ordinary world we live in. We live in an ordinary world where the sins that once defined you and the sins that currently trap you are required to define your future. I'm never going to be free of this. I'm never going to be broken with this. He's always going to struggle with this. She's always going to do that. It's never going to be better. And an ordinary world gets into your heart and messes you up and you get so discouraged you think you're going to die. Because you just feel so trapped. But there is a world shepherded by your Christ. A world 
of truth and power that shatters those ordinary expectations and changes everything about you and everything about your loved ones. Hear the word of God. Hear the word of Jesus Christ talking about the power of God. It's in John chapter 8. And in verse 34, Jesus says, truly, truly, you hear this? Listen, listen, Jesus says. I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. That's awful. That says... You have a master. You think you're free and you're not. You think you can do whatever you want and you can't. You you have a master. You have somebody that tells you what to do. And that master is called sin. And what Jesus says here is that that master has you chained up to it. So tight you can barely breathe. And wherever that sin goes is where you go. You are sin's lap dog. You just have to do it. But Jesus keeps going. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain. Jesus stops talking about sin and he starts talking about an intervention. He starts talking about an invasion of this sinful world by himself. See, God looks down at your enslavement to the master you love called sin. And instead of being filled with disgust and revulsion, he's overcome with love and mercy. In the kind grace of God, the love of God overwhelms the wrath of God, and he sends Jesus Christ to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, and to raise from the grave to defeat sin. And not to just defeat sin, but to defeat your sin. So that when you believe in him, something happens to you. Something wonderful. Something true. Something more powerful than anything you could possibly imagine. In verse 36, so If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is extraordinary truth and extraordinary power crashing into your little ordinary life. And it changes the way you think. When you trust in Jesus, your anger doesn't define you. Your pride doesn't define you. Your worry doesn't define you. Your lust doesn't control you. When the Son of God sets you free, you are free indeed. you got to believe that. you got to trust that. You've got to let the power of Christ kick in the door of your sinful heart. And change everything about it. That's what he is. That's what he does. Your prodigal children don't need to follow an ordinary path. Your struggle with sin doesn't need to follow an ordinary path. And here's the last thing. Your problems in this world are not going to follow an ordinary path. Your prodigal children don't have to follow an ordinary path. Your sins don't have to follow an ordinary path, but your problems in this world are not going to follow an ordinary path. We live in an ordinary world where, honestly, you just come to expect that things are going to go from bad to worse. Nothing's going to get any better. It's just going to stay this way. The uh, financial problems and pressures that you face, you finally feel like you're getting on some steady ground and then gas prices go up and inflation goes up and you're behind again. You live in a world where you are a little weaker today than you were yesterday. And you're a little stronger today than you will be tomorrow. You live in a world where 
the cancer diagnosis comes in and there's nothing they can do. And you just come to expect that it's going to go the way it goes. Your back hurts a little bit more today than it did yesterday. You're a little slower this year than you were 10 years ago. Our problems just keep, keep accruing. They keep getting worse. And even when they fix this problem, another comes along and you wind up in the grave just like everybody else. That's the individual problem. Then there's the problems in the world. The problems in the world are shockingly discouraging. I was born in the last year of the Carter administration. Back then, the government was in a mess. Inflation was through the roof, and we were at risk of a war with Russia. And after 40 years, the government's in a mess. Inflation is through the roof, and we are at risk of a war with Russia. My goodness, that's so ordinary. That's just what you'd expect from this lousy world. Forty years later, Berlin Wall's down, and we're back where we started. What are you going to do about problems like that and a world like that where it seems like nothing gets better, the best, it stays the same, but really it always gets worse? What are we going to do? Jesus comes at you. He comes at you with truth and power. In John chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Do not let your heart be troubled. This is Jesus. Don't you let your heart be troubled. You know what that means? It means don't let your heart be troubled. That's what it means. It means don't let your heart be troubled when the medical diagnosis comes in. It means don't you dare watch Fox News and let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. How can that be? How can I watch the news and not let my heart be troubled? How can I live with this body that's getting frailer and frailer and not let my heart be troubled? Well, Jesus realigns your vision. He gives you something else to look at. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus says, look at something else. Focus on something else. Be captivated by something else. What is it? Believe in God and believe in me. Trust in me. Trust in my power. Trust in my love. Get your, your eyes off of the things of the world and turn your eyes on Jesus. And when you turn your eyes on Jesus, he will introduce you to a world that is sparkling with hope. He will introduce you to a world of wonder and glory that he calls I love it. He calls it the resurrection. This world of wonder and glory that Jesus calls the resurrection is a time and it is a place. It's a time, it's a time when history comes to an end. When this ordinary world has taken its best shot. When every corrupt leader and every foreign army and every nuclear power has tried their best to mess it up and you've tried your best to mess it up and the devil has tried his best to mess it up and Jesus Christ comes in at the end of time and just with a wave of his perfect hand makes all the trouble go away. And the credits on history start to roll, and that's when your life really begins. And you will live in a world of wonder like the angels more spectacular than you can imagine. 
Just think of how good it's going to be. And Jesus will do 10 million times better than that. You'll be amazed and overwhelmed with wonder and glory every single day of eternity. Why? Because of who presides over that wonderful world. In verse 32, Jesus reminds the Sadducees of another text in Scripture. Another text in the Bible. He takes it from the book of Exodus because one of the Sadducees' problems is that they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They didn't take anything else. He says, all right, if you want some Bible, I'll give you some Bible. And he says, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And then Jesus gives his commentary. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. This is a, this is a quote from Exodus chapter 3, when Moses has fled from Egypt into an ordinary life in the desert. And he's an ordinary shepherd, taking his ordinary flock up an ordinary hill. And in the distance, he sees something extraordinary. He sees a bush <laughs> that is ignited in flames, but it's not consumed. And this ordinary man walks over to this extraordinary sight. And from the midst of the fire, God speaks. And God, who is the ever eternally present God, speaks of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who had been dead for hundreds of years. He speaks at them, of them like they're alive like they're present, because they are. They are present with Him. They know Him. They are alive as He is. And you will be too in this glorious resurrection that is waiting for you, just as real as your existence today. You just can't see it. And so Jesus is here in the power of the Spirit for you to let you know that there's something extraordinary for you. Don't you dare doubt it. Don't you dare wonder at it. You are living no ordinary life. This is no ordinary world. And God is no ordinary God, but is going to give you extraordinary things. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, help us to marvel at Jesus. Help us to marvel at His truth and His power. Crash our ordinary expectations and give us faith and hope in who Jesus is and what he has waiting for us. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.